Now, Dr. Meyer, this stuff is amazing, okay? And given how quickly these complex animals arose, in the absence of prior ancestors, how have the neo-Darwinian paleontologists attempted to explain the missing Precambrian ancestral fossils? Well, as Dr. Chen uh, alluded uh, to, there are many paleontologists now who are acknowledging that the Cambrian explosion is a real event and that it does pose a challenge to the textbook theory of evolution that we all learn called neo-Darwinism. But there are still defenders of neo-Darwinism out there, and what they have typically proposed to explain away the absence of these ancestral forms is something called the artifact hypothesis. And what the artifact hypothesis is, is it's a kind of uh, modified version of the idea that Darwin put forward in the 19th century, that we're, we're not seeing the ancestral forms either because we haven't looked hard enough uh, or because for some reason these ancestral forms were not preserved. So the, the technical way of referring to that is the, the idea that the, the missing ancestral uh, animals to the Cambrian animals that arise later, uh, the, 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 those ancestors are missing and they're missing as an artifact of either incomplete sampling of the fossil record or as a result of incomplete preservation. Now, 150 years since the publication of The Origin of Species, and given all these different fossil finds, no one really can say we haven't looked hard enough anymore. So what people are now saying is that, that the, the fossils are missing because of incomplete preservation. And in particular, the, the idea that's put forward is that the missing ancestors weren't preserved because they were either too small or too soft to have been preserved. And that's the version of the artifact hypothesis that's, that's still in currency. And yet there's been another discovery in China that has really challenged that idea. In fact, I think challenged it a very fun, in a very fundamental way. Yeah, and that's what we're going to go to next in this next clip, folks. What fossil evidence refutes the artifact hypothesis that the reason the missing links the prior ancestors of the Cambrian animals have not been found is because they were too soft and too small to have been preserved. I want you to watch this next clip. The Xinjiang fossils provide the most inclusive picture of the Cambrian explosion yet documented. And directly beneath them, in Precambrian shales, another chapter in the history of life is written in the rocks. There's another amazing find that's been made in China. Paleobiologists have discovered little tiny microscopic sponge embryos in the layers of rock just beneath the layer that documents the Cambrian explosion. These embryos were soft-bodied animals. Some fossilized 60 million years before the Cambrian explosion. Their eggs and embryos, which are preserved in thin crusts of mineralized material, a phosphatic material, on ancient seafloors, which suggests that the chemistry of the seawater in those days was somewhat different than it is today because this method of preserving fossils disappears during the Cambrian, and it's not around today. So we're lucky that we have these thin crusts with little tiny fossils in them. This is highly significant because one of the most popular explanations for the missing Precambrian fossils is that the Precambrian animals were too soft and too small to have been preserved. Since 1999, Paul Chien has studied fossil embryos and helped develop techniques to analyze their structure. By treating with acid, you can actually remove the rock and isolate the embryos, and then you get um, around pebble-like or sand grain-like samples. And, uh, and then uh, we look through some tiny little ones, uh, larger ones up to one millimeter in size. And we found about the range between 500 and 800 micrometers. We have mostly sponge. And then uh, I start breaking up these balls and, and try to uh, start looking inside. And with the help of electron microscope, I was able to see the detailed subcell structure within these embryos. Chen's work on these fragile remnants of Precambrian life raises an important question. If these lower strata can preserve an embryo, if they can preserve a soft microscopic embryo, then why couldn't they have preserved the larger ancestral forms that supposedly evolved into the Cambrian animals?
In other words, if you can preserve something as fragile as an embryo, why couldn't you, in the same strata of rock, preserve the immediate ancestor of a hard-shelled trilobite? So the idea that the fossil record is too damaged to provide us with at least a general picture, uh, that idea just doesn't wash. Steve, what we just saw was incredible, and I can remember when I was in school having professors tell me, yeah, the missing links are missing because they're soft-bodied, and the fact is there's no way to keep them uh, in the fossil record. That just went down the tubes with that last clip. What are neo-Darwinian paleontologists now saying about what they're going to do? Well, I, th I think we should just talk about paleontologists and Cambrian paleontologists because I think uh, increasingly many paleontologists are not necessarily committed to neo-Darwinism because it has so many problems. Uh, they're committed to some form of evolutionary theory typically, but um, now many leading paleontologists, uh, certainly in China, but also leading American paleontologists are saying that whatever we make of the Cambrian explosion, however we attempt to explain it, we have to start from the premise that this is a real event. It's not an artifact of incomplete sampling. It's not an artifact of incomplete preservation. It's a real event, and it has to be, it has to be reckoned with. And uh, some of the leading Chinese paleontologists, J.Y. Chen has been very outspoken in, in making this point. There's a, a major book on the Cambrian explosion that came out in 2013 by uh, Doug Irwin of the Smithsonian Institution and uh, James Valentine, who was shown in that previous clip from the University of California, Berkeley, in which they make this same point. The Cambrian is a real event. We may not have a good explanation for it, but we've got to reckon on the event as something that really happened. It's not just uh, uh, something that is a kind of illusion from our not uh, being able to see what happened in the lower strata. We now have good reason to think that the the uh, lower strata, or the, the depositional environment in the Precambrian was capable of preserving even small and soft organisms, and therefore the absence of the, the ancestral forms of the larger organisms with hard parts should certainly have been there if those animals existed, if those precursors existed, that they weren't preserved is best explained by the supposition that they weren't there. Yeah. What does this do to the neo-Darwinian theory? Well, it certainly, again, challenges the neo-Darwinian picture of the history of life, uh, the first complex forms of animal life seem to arise very abruptly, and it also challenges the idea that the neo-Darwinian mechanism was the mechanism by which these complex forms of life arose because that, uh, that mechanism requires a vast amount of time, and it should have left behind a, a vast number of failed experiments, if you will. It's a trial and error mechanism where you get lots of different uh, uh, variations arising, different mutational changes arising, so we ought to see the evidence of all those failed trials in the lower strata, and they're not there. So it, it raises questions both about the pattern, the picture of the history of life that Darwin proposed, but also it raises questions about whether the mechanism of natural selection and random mutation is really what was at work in producing these first complex forms of animal life. Yeah, set us up for next week, because we're going into what you really want to talk about, and that is the fact is we're getting to, in the fossil record, Biologists are saying, we now know how, a little bit about how animals are made, and that's a problem. Well, the, the, in my book, Darwin's Doubt, I talk about two great mysteries. And the first mystery is, is pretty easy to comprehend. It's the mystery of the missing fossils. It's the, the, they're simply not there. not there. What we'd expect to see in the ancestral, in the lower Precambrian layers are not there. But I think there's an even deeper mystery. And that is the mystery that I call uh, the engineering mystery. How do you build an animal? How would the evolutionary process build an animal, especially when you have such a compressed time scale? And that mystery has been made very much more acute by discoveries that have been made uh, uh, since Darwin's time, in particular discoveries in the field of molecular biology about the importance of information, digital codes stored in the DNA molecule, and the importance of that information to building animals. And as we've come to appreciate, that building animals requires vast sections of digital information, essentially assembly instructions, the Cambrian explosion becomes an engineering problem. Where would all that information come from? How would it get built? Because we now know that you need that kind of information to build an animal. Yeah. Now, folks, we're just starting to unscramble that for you, and it's a deep mystery, and Stephen is one of the world's best in explaining that, and we're going to attempt to show you what is needed in terms of information, genetic information of how you build an, an animal, and then we're gonna ask the question, 
where did all of this information come from? We're going to start that next week. I hope you'll join us.